good morning. <clears throat> he is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, I'm glad you could be with us on Easter Sunday morning. My name is Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Communion Hanover. We are meeting in person. We begin our worship at 1030 and, of course, our main message at 11 o'clock, and we're at 7300 Hanover Green Drive. So we hope you can join us um, in the future. So let's begin with a prayer. Father in heaven, today, monumental, above all days in the Christian calendar, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. He, the vicarious human being, who has gathered humanity into himself for his incarnate work in accomplishing your will for humanity, to have us in union with you. And so, Father, as we celebrate, we pray for a deeper understanding of what it means for us that the vicarious man went to the cross, into the grave, and out. So, Holy Spirit, teach us, tutor us. We want to know as we are known. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So, one of my favorite Easter passages is in Matthew 28. Uh, we'll go ahead and put it up. You can read along. And um, there's, uh, there's a, a part of me that rises up and, and um, is invigorated, I guess is the word, by this passage <clears throat> in um, Matthew 28. In verse 1, after the Sabbath on the first day of the week, as it was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been raised, as he said. In, in my mind, I don't know how you see this angel, right? And I know how we paint angels sometimes in antiquity. You know, the angels look like you could blow on them and knock them over. You know, like if a gust of wind came along, it would blow them off the steps or what have you. Um, I don't see these angels that way. I see the angel with rippling muscles and, and veins popping out of their forearms and mighty swords that no human could wield. And I, I see these angels as, as these, not male or female, but just these beings that, that represent power and authority. That when you see, I mean, because when people see these angels, what do they do? Well, they become like dead men. It must be an impressive sight. It can't be, if the angels are the way we paint them, little wings and little baby faces, a little bow and arrow, you, you wouldn't fall in fear of that. You, you know, you might go get your fly swat or your bug spray. I don't know what that was, the weirdest looking bug. It's a pretty big bug, but psst, get out of here. These these angels, every place in the Bible where people are confronted by angels, the first thing the angel has to say is, hey, don't be afraid. We're on the same side here. I'm, I'm a messenger from God. This angel came down and rolled back this stone that no one else could touch, and then he sat on it. And in my mind's eye, I see this impressive, imposing, powerful-looking creature sitting on this stone with his arms folded as if to say, Try to move it back. Do you remember Robert Conrad, the Energizer commercial that he did back in the 80s where he had the battery on his shoulder and he says, knock it off, I dare you, you know, because he was a tough guy. Not nearly as imposing. Robert Conrad was like, what, five, six, or seven? He wasn't a huge guy. He might have made up for it with, with um, stamina and attitude, <clears throat> but somebody like Mike Tyson wouldn't have been in impressed by him at all, or especially afraid of him. This angel, these angels are imposing, powerful, impressive creatures. And this angel came and he rolled back the stone and then he sat on it. And then he's got a message, not for the soldiers. He's got a message for these women, Mary and Mary, who came to see 
about Jesus. And he said, he's not here. Come have a look. And what you find is the, is the grave clothes neatly folded. Today I want to talk about the vicarious humanity of Jesus. What does that mean? What is, what is the vicarious humanity of Jesus? What is the representative humanity of Jesus? What is it for us? What does it mean for us when the Apostle Paul calls Jesus the last Adam? It's a common theme here at Grace Communion Hanover. And you know, I do from time to time, I do hear from people who um, maybe disagree with what we're saying or I've, I've been accused of um, ear tickling. You ever heard that phrase, ear tickling? That is preachers just tickling people's ears. Well, the gospel is, what does the word gospel mean? It means good news, right? What is good news supposed to do? But tickle your ears. When you hear good news, you're not supposed to go, oh, yeah, you know what, you're right. I'm, yeah, my bad. I know I'm just a piece of garbage, and maybe God will help me someday. What are you supposed to do when you hear good news? The 16th century Oxford Dictionary of the word gospel is this, the good, glad, merry news that makes a man fairly leap for joy. If what you hear, if it's called the good news, and it doesn't make you want to leap for joy, then I don't think it's the good news. Is there a time for us to correct one another in love? Does the Bible correct? Of course, God's re reproval of us is important. God chastises those whom he loves. But the gospel is good news. And the gospel centers not around the idea that you can invite Jesus into your life. The gospel centers around the idea that Jesus has brought you into his the gospel is about the vicarious man. The gospel is not about primarily you having a relationship with Jesus. The gospel is primarily about this Jesus who has a relationship with his father and has therefore brought you into the center of that relationship. That's what makes the gospel good news. The gospel is not the news that, hey, here's a plan. Here's a formula for you to work out, and maybe God will accept you. That's actually Greek philosophy. That's actually what the Apostle Paul is referring to when he says, let no one take you captive through vain philosophies. He doesn't just call them pagan like they are. He calls them vain, useless, worthless. The philosophy that there's a formula you can work out that will make God accept you or in some way obligate God to receive you is false. I watched uh, Baxter Kruger and Malcolm Smith together uh, this week. And Malcolm just blew me away. I had never considered this before. And he talked about the fact that, that a lot of Christians, when they die, what do we talk about doing? Going, where are we going when we die? Going to heaven. And one of the reasons that we say that a lot is because we, we, we're not consciously thinking about going into the arms of the Father. Because in the Western Christian tradition, in a lot of cases, we've been taught to be afraid of the Father. Oh, I'm, just, I'm going to heaven, and hopefully I won't have to run into you know the big guy because he's scary. He's really scary. In fact, he's so scary... Sometimes what we say is, he really wanted to zap you out of the cosmos, but Jesus, he's pretty cool. And he said, Dad, don't do it. They're my friends. Don't wipe them off the face of the earth. And so then God the Father said, well, if, if you don't want me to kill them, then I guess I'll have to kill you. Is that what happened? The cross is not about an angry God killing his son so he doesn't have to kill us. Jesus goes willingly to the cross, not to appease an angry father. Jesus goes willingly to the cross so that you can go to the cross. Were you there 
when they crucified my Lord. It's a very old song. It was written, nobody knows who wrote it, but uh, most people agree it was written in the South uh, in the 19th century at some point by slaves. And um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, it began to be included in a lot of hymnals. I think beginning with the Methodist hymnal, maybe then the Episcopal. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You know, there's this interesting phenomenon um, with our memories. Our memories a lot of times um, are tied to, or I, I, I've got that backwards. This is the way to say it. Monumental events in history are a lot, oftentimes tied to our own personal memories, our own personal history. I'll give you a case in point. My parents could tell you where they were when they found out that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated or when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I can remember where I was when I got the news that the space shuttle Challenger had exploded. I can remember where I was when 9-11 happened, and exactly what I was doing and who I was in the room. I was in an engineering meeting. I can remember where I was and what I was doing when I heard that Prince had died. Because, you know, celebrities die, right? But that one, because I'm a guitar player and a big fan of Prince, that one hit me. I mean, I hurt my heart. I cried. I didn't want us to lose um, Prince. So you're... Your memories a lot of times are tied to these, your personal memories are tied to these monumental events, things that happen in your life. You remember where you were when you got married? Just kidding. Of course you do. <laughs> you remember where you were when your kid was born? Yeah, of course you do. If your mom, of course you remember where you were. If your dad, you know, hopefully you were able to be there. Do you remember where you were when Jesus was laid bare and nailed to a cross? Well, you might not remember, but maybe I can jog your memory today. Maybe not me. Maybe we can let the words of the Holy Scriptures jog your memory. Paul the Apostle in Galatians says, I am crucified with Christ. What does he mean, I am crucified with Christ? Is he speaking in metaphor? No, he's not speaking in metaphor. What does it mean when the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 calls Jesus the last Adam? What is this last Adam business? The late theologian T.F. Torrance refers to this concept of Jesus being the last Adam as federal headship. So here it is in a nutshell. In the garden, Adam, the first man, is given federal headship over the whole human race. If, if Adam gets it right, then it is impugned to all of us as right. If Adam gets it wrong, we're all in trouble. And none of us in the Christian West have any trouble recognizing the fact that when Adam got it wrong, it rippled forward throughout all of human history and affects everyone. Right? We, 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 we read the, the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans where he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we go, yeah. That's, that means you, 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 and every other you there is. Everybody. But then when we read the, the words of Paul where he says, I'm convinced of this, that one died for all, therefore all died, we go, ah, don't get too carried away with this all business. Starting to sound like a universalist. We only think it's universalism because we don't know what universalism is. Universalism is the idea that God is going to make the decision for you. That God is going to make you say yes. Did you know that that coin has another side? There's another side of that coin. When you flip it over, there's, a, there's an idea that God's going to make 
a certain number of people say yes and a certain number of people say no. That he's already, how to say this, predestined who would say yes and who would say no. And if you're in the no column, there's nothing you can do about it. That's literally the other side of the universalism coin. The most precious thing about you, the most precious thing about you is your personhood. God has given you personhood in his cosmos. You can say yes to him and you can say no. And if there's no possibility for you to say no, then the yes means nothing at all. A captive bride with no ability to walk away is no bride at all. She is a prisoner. You are not a prisoner. You are the bride of Christ. In 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul says that there is one God and mediator. One mediator between God and man. The man himself, Christ Jesus. And this word for mediator literally means one who intervenes to restore relationships. Who but Jesus has intervened to, to restore relationships? When these monumental events happen in our lives, you know, we think back on them. We say, well, what happened? And we want to know all the details of what happened. Well, there was an O-ring, and it was, it was in, improperly manufactured, it, or it was improperly installed, and we know that now, that the O-ring leaked in the Space Shuttle Challenger, in the booster rockets, and it caused a failure, which led to the ignition, uh, the simultaneous ignition of all of the solid rocket propellant. And it literally disintegrated the, the ship just moments after it had launched. What happened on the cross? Maybe it's important to say what didn't happen. I, let me just tell you one thing that didn't happen on the cross. Jesus was not abandoned by his father on the cross. That's one thing that didn't happen. Here's another thing that didn't happen. Jesus did not take a beating from his father that God the Father really wanted to give you. What happened on the cross is the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, went to the cross as God and man to represent both sides of the covenant. Ask yourself this question. What happens to the cosmos if Jesus is torn from the Trinity? How do you tear Jesus from the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit that's existed before anything else? How do you tear apart the Godhead God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself on the cross. Go read Paul. Go read Paul. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians especially. He wants you to know that we are dealing with this all too important, this significant middle term. Not just God speaking to humanity and not just our pitiful, puny attempts to respond, but in Jesus Christ, the God-man, in his divinity, he is speaking on behalf of God, and in his humanity, he is responding on behalf of you. Jesus is the vicarious human being. He is you, like Ivan said in the worship. He is you, as you, for you, in you, with you, and he added one, in spite of you. Right? Because we don't always get it right. And what happens when you don't get it right? Is your sin, are your mistakes, Jesus repellent? Like if you know you're going to go do something you really shouldn't do, and you don't want to feel guilty about it, or at least you don't want to be embarrassed thinking that Jesus is watching, you can maybe say a couple of swear words ahead of time, make Jesus run away, and then hurry and do whatever you were going to do. It's ridiculous. Jesus lives in us. He is in us. We live and move and have our being in Jesus. Now read Acts 28. 
we live and move and have our being in us. And, and when that was said, the Apostle Paul said this to pagans. He even said, even your pagan poets got it right when they said we're his offspring. Hey, you got all these monuments to these unknown gods. You don't know his name. Just because you don't know his name doesn't mean you're exactly wrong. I'll tell you his name. His name is Jesus. And you live and move and have your being in him. Jesus has taken you. When I am lifted up from the earth, Jesus says, I will draw all humanity to myself. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Jesus became sin for us. He who was without sin was made to become sin for us. That, that's submarines, doesn't it? The idea that sin separates us from God? Of course, how could sin separate you from God? What parent, when their kid gets in trouble, distances themselves, themselves from their kid? You told your kid not to go in the swimming pool when you weren't around. You watch from the window as your four-year-old toddles off the end of the diving board into the deep end of the pool, unable to swim. And what do you do? Well, of course, you stand at the window and you fold your arms and you go, I told you. And this is what you get for your disobedience. What does a parent do? If it's first floor window, I'm probably going through it. You're going out there. You can't be separate. You can't be and be separated from God. You have no power to be here. You cannot will yourself the next heartbeat. It's a gift. You cannot exist separated from the sustainer of the cosmos. Where were you? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I sing that song rhetorically because I know where you were. I know where you were when they crucified my Lord. You were in the same place as me. You were in Jesus, the vicarious human being. This is the only way Paul can say that I am crucified with Christ. This is the only way the Apostle Paul can say, one died, therefore all died. You died when Jesus died. And what happened to you on this day that we commemorate? On the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus is the vicarious human being, then I can say, when he died, I died. And when he was raised, I was raised. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the disciple, the apostle, the one who denied Jesus thrice on the night of his betrayal. The one who stepped out of the boat when no one else had the courage to. The one who mistook the events of the Passion Week for the inauguration of a violent overthrow of Rome and took the ear of a Roman soldier. The one who on the day of Pentecost arrives suddenly with more courage and boldness, parousia is the word, unearthly assurance, than anyone would have ever expected from the man who showed cowardice and ran and denied Jesus the night of his betrayal. Listen to the words of the Apostle Peter. Blessed be the God and Father, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, kept in heaven for you. You are not the steward of your gift of God because we are not capable. We are mere infants. 
as those who will live for eternity in Jesus Christ. We are infants. I don't care how old you are. If you're watching this, if you're here in the room, and you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you could be 150 years old, I will look at you and say you're an infant. We're but children. What good parent would entrust such an inheritance to an infant? I was visiting a church member. This is a decade or more than a decade ago who was in the hospital at the end of her life, and she had been chronically ill from the time she was a small child. And she was ready to go home. She was tired. She was tired of being in and out of the doctor's office. She was tired of taking pills. She was tired of being poked and prodded and temperature, IV, everything. She was tired. Exasperated, she looked at me and she said, I've been sick my whole life. Her name was Mrs. Carter, and I said, no, you haven't, Mrs. Carter. I said, because you're going to live for eternity. And, and there will come a day in eternity when you ha will have lived for so long in your glorified body that the, the 70 plus years that you spent on this earth sick will seem so small in comparison that you will be able to say, I've never been sick a day in my life. We are but mere infants. We have been born again. Anaganal, by the way, same word Jesus used when he was talking to Nicodemus, and he said, unless a man be born again, he can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. How can I be born again? You can't, Nick. Watch what I'm going to do because Jesus, the vicarious man, is going to die and be born again for you and therefore you will be born again, as Peter said. Peter got it. Peter understood and he wrote it down for us. You've been given this new birth, not because you said a prayer, not because you believe in Jesus. Yes, that's important. And there's something that happens in us and we have to have words to talk about it. And in some way, we say, I was born again. But your being born again, your anaganal, your born from above is an accomplishment of Jesus Christ. I didn't do that. I can't take credit for that. Jesus is the vicarious man. Jesus somehow took you with him. Well, I wasn't even born yet. And that happened 2,000 years ago. Maybe you think I'm crazy. Maybe you think the cheese fell off my cracker. I don't know. I don't know what you think. But I know where you were when they crucified my Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you didn't leave it up to us. Lord, I, I can look back at my own life and think about how many opportunities you put in front of me that I squandered. I praise your heavenly name that you did not give me the opportunity to win my salvation. I praise your heavenly name that you have taken full responsibility for me in my sorry state. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you have your uh, communion elements, of course, we, we, um, we always take communion on Easter Sunday, but um, now that's because we always take on, uh, communion on Sunday. So we'll celebrate our common union, and we invite you to the table of the Lord. Thank you. Yes. When I was growing up on our little farm in uh, eastern North Carolina, 
uh, it was not uncommon for stray animals to show up. And my sister, Becky, who has uh, she's got a special way with animals, um, she would feed them and pet them. And, you know, they would hang around as long as they wanted to. And uh, we never considered them ours, per se. But for some, we were just a stop-off point. And uh, there was one dog in particular that my father um, said had obviously been abused because you could never pet this dog. If you got close, it would tuck its tail and run away. dog's name was Rusty. And um, my sister got to pet Rusty one time um, later before it, it moved on, but nobody could pet this dog because it believed things about us that weren't true. And there was no way to deprogram this dog. What if you could kill Rusty and resurrect Rusty without all of that fallen mythology about us? You see, Jesus put our fallen humanity's mythology about God to death on the cross and brought us out in a new birth to a new life. And we signify that. We remember that. We commemorate it. We celebrate it in the body of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus. Well, bless you. Bless you each one in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.